in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to use iGraph in R specifically. So if you're using Python or any other uh, code, I'm, I'm not sure how this will relate, but I'm sure it'll be similar. So uh, just see how it goes. All right, so I've already got some data. So this is my own uh, personal research, uh, and it's got nothing to do with the tutorial per se, but it will show you how I, I've used um, iGraph in, in my personal case. Okay, uh, let me just run this piece of code. So you don't really need to understand what's going on over here. Um, but what you need, do need to understand is how to get, how to make a um, iGraph object. So in this specific case, I have a edge list, right? So which is stored in this graph uh, data frame. And that gives me a from and to. Uh, so the first column is from, the second column is to. Um, it's got a set of edge lists that goes from two, and I'm going to say directed is true. So let's let's go ahead and run, run this bit. Okay, now that I run that, it's only given me an object, so it's saved in memory. Now, if you want to visualize this, what you what I want you to run is TK plot lasso graph. So you might want to if you if you done this before, you might uh, try and use pl uh, plot on itself, but TK plot is better. Uh, Okay, the reason that it's better is because it, it gives me this. Um, I can, so this is an interactive kind of uh, plotting tool. So I can move around the edges with the way that I want to. Um, so let me, so I don't think you can see, but um, so if I make this full screen, see how this clusters up over here? If you want to make it bigger, what you need to go is go view and fit to screen. Okay, so th th that's that's on the tab up, uh, tab at the top, okay? Um, and the other, there's this other cool uh, stuff that, that you can do, which I'll quickly show you. So, uh, for example, the layout, uh, I can make it into a circle. So it, it, there you go, it, it, it's um, laid out nicely in a circle. Or if I want to see how it's connected, I think, um, so just play with the layout options, but I think this will, this should do. Uh, no, that wasn't the one I was after. Uh, Anyway, just have, have a play around with this with the layout options because it does give you some really good uh, visualization options. Okay, let's close this for now. Now, in my in my particular application, I have a true graph, and what I showed you was the graph that I personally inferred. So some of the edges were wrong, some of the edges were correct. Uh, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to color all the edges as gray to start off with. Okay, so uh, don't worry about any more image that you get. But basically all I've done is say E, the, the function E stands for edge, and says the dollar color, make sure it's gray. Okay, so it, it accepts most colors as the way that you type it. Um, now what I'm going to do is the ones that I've detected as being correct, I'm going to label them as, as being red. Okay, so from my color, the subset, which which, have, which I'm doing in the square brackets, is going to be a subset that I've already uh, preset in my in my da own data frame, right? Uh, again, so don't worry about my data. Just, so this is just a tutorial on how to use iGraph. Um, I want to color those edges as red, the ones that are de detected properly. Okay, and now let me do, do the, the graphing again. So if I draw this again, so now I, I start to see a, a set of red edges. Okay, so the ones that are detected properly. Uh, obviously, this is a bad inference on my part, but again, that's not really not the point of this tutorial, right? Um, so, so there you go. Okay, and another thing that I want to show you is sometimes I want to I want to play around the vertices, right? So I want to say, first of all, you have to you have to set the base case to be gray or some other color. Uh, you can't just uh, you can't just pick and choose the colors to be or colors of a subset to be a particular color because you need to define a, a base case before you start using the color option. Okay, so I'm going to define in my case the the base case color of vert a vertex to be gray. And, and again, don't worry about any warnings. Um, and then I'm going to say the degree. If if the degree of my graph, so I I set my object to be lasso graph. Right. If the degree of my 
object, the out degree, I should say, so I've said mode out is greater than five, I'm going to color those vertices as being yellow. Okay, so let me let me say that again. Say that again. So out of my vertices, uh, like out of the entire subset, that's what's inside the square bracket, I'm going to choose the degree that's greater than five. And I'm going to choose the out degree to be greater than five because by default, it's everything. Okay, so I'm going to color those as being yellow. Okay, so the color attribute is going to be yellow. And now when I plot my graph again, Okay, so in this case, I didn't have any out degree being five. Uh, let me choose. Uh, let me let me do something else. Let me let me say instead of out, just let it be all. And I'll say is uh, greater than. Let's say greater than four, just so that I can show you something. Greater than or equal to four. Okay, there you go. So I have a few yellow. Uh, vertices, right? So the rest is gray. Okay, um, now that's not really, that's not all that iGraph can do. It's, it's actually quite a powerful package. So one thing that was fairly useful for me was to find the strongly connected components. So a strongly connected component in a directed graph is something that is cyclical, right? So if, if I can move from vertex one to three, I can move from three back to one. Okay, so there's some sort of cycle somewhere, right? So uh, to to find out what the strongly connected components are, there's a there's a function called clusters, and then you send input your input your graph object, and you go strong. Okay, so there's weakly connected connected components as well, uh, which I'm not too familiar about because I'm not really my background is not in gra graph theory, uh, but you know strong strongly connected components are definitely a problem. Okay, so now if I so I'll show you what. Uh, my SCC my strongly connected component looks like okay so the membership um, the membership is really the uh, the vertex so the the cluster size um, okay so I, let me let me see if I can remember this so that so each vertex is listed over here in the under the membership all right so all my all my vertices in this particular graph and then the cluster size is how big each cluster is so okay so sorry about that so I, I just figured out what SEC does so the strong connected components give you this uh, this three attributes called membership cluster size and the number of vertices okay so the membership what it says is that the first vertex and I don't mean vertex number one okay so the number is actually completely independent in this of, of what the numbers are over here um, so the first vertex that I look at is in cluster number 70. The second cluster is in uh, 54 and so on. Because the reason is, if you look at these three, it's 45, 45, 45. So number four, number five, number six is in the cluster number 45. Okay, so if I look at cluster size, you'll see that the 45th element has five elements in there. Okay, so it has five vertices. So I only located the first three. Uh, th there should be another two somewhere else. Okay. Um, okay, and you get that by doing clusters. Less, you send in your graph object, and then you s say strong. Okay, now suppose I'm interested in finding which, which clusters ha uh, have uh, a strongly connected component that has more than one vertex, right? So it's the, one, the clusters that have more than one vertex is really the big problem over here because you don't want cyclic components, right? So, uh, so let's, let's just take a look at this. So I'm just gonna get the vertex, I, the index number, so which shows the, um, which shows which vertices are. Okay, so it's, it's gonna be vert vertex number 29 for uh, the vert vertices in cluster, which have the identity 29, okay, so it's, so if I if I look at this one, it says forty five over here. So in this case, there you go, a whole bunch a couple, whole bunch of forty fives. Right. So in the same way, I should be able to find a couple of twenty nines. So I find it. There's a twenty nine over there. Okay, this is going to take too long, so I'm going to leave that up to you. Um, okay. So finally, what we're really interested in is to get the actual vertices that are that have a cluster size greater than one. Okay. So 
So what I'm going to do is now that I got the, ver the vertex index, I'm going to go out of my vertices of, of, the, of this lasso, the, the graph object. I'm going to pull out the ones from my membership that have the, this particular identity, okay? this particular index. So let's do that. So there you go. Okay, so from doing this, I pulled out the the ver the the uh, vertices is 23, 5, 69, 57, and 59. So these five components are uh, strongly connected. Okay, so if if I go back to my graph, so let me plot my graph again. Uh, so if I find the number 23. Okay, so this is actually harder than I thought to find. Um, okay, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. So, uh, so basically, if you if you look at your direct, directed graph, you'll find you should be able to find uh, find a connected, strongly connected component with with these particular indices. Now, the problem is for you, you can't actually extract these numbers. So, if I say, if I go back to this command and go a is equal to but A is a vertex sequence, so I can't do A of 1. It will give me a null character. So if I go A of 3, and I certainly can't seem to get them, get them out in any other way. Uh, so the way, that, the way that you extract the vertices is a bit tricky. So I want to say this is really what, what we're after. Unique as vector uh, the, the from to uh, data frame. Okay, so I'm going to take the from and to from the data frame and then grab the unique objects out of them. So because that will give me the order of which the vertices appear. Okay, so that's really what I need. So if I if I do that, this this is the order that my uh, the vertices appear. Okay, and from that, if I grab again the same index set that I was after before. I get 23, 5, 69, 57, 59. And this time, the actual numbers that you can extract for yourself. Okay, so to, to extract for yourself, you need to use this unique option and then and then work through the uh, work through the, the nodes. Okay, and also you can do uh, cool stuff like um, grabbing the, the vert vertex set where the degree is greater than 5. So if I do that, there you go. Um, that's that's all I have for today. Actually, there's one more thing. Uh, now, in my previous example, what I did was give you a way of getting a graph object in iGraph using a from to list, right? So from an edge list. But suppose you have a matrix, right? A square matrix that's non-zero where you have an edge and zero elsewhere. In order to change those those kind of graphs into uh, into iGraph object. So in this particular case, we use the function call, called graph.data.frame to convert it into a uh, into a iGraph object. But in order to convert a matrix into a iGraph object, you need to use this function called graph.adjacency. Okay, and then you input your uh, input your matrix of whatever you have. But it has to be a square matrix, and the mode as uh, it should be undirected, but um, and in fact, I, th I think if you don't set it to, if you set it to be directed, uh, I think the positive, the positive values will be taken to be uh, from to, to, and the negative values the other way around. But d don't quote me on that. I think that's how it works. Uh, anyway, if you have any questions or comments, let me know. But I hope you hope that was useful. Thank you.